Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what's using my life? Heard a guy give a lecture one time that says, we are today what we were when. And he was talking about the fact that we, to a great extent, behave, think, react because of some previous experience that we've had. One of the things that we know about life is that it is always changing. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes things go real well, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes you're happy, and sometimes you're sad. Now that's that thing called life. And when we begin to understand and know that, accepting that reality that, that we will never ever have things just on an even kill all the time, that you're gonna have some ups and you're gonna have some downs. But during those down moments, that's where the growth takes place. That's where the work is. See, anybody can feel good when they have their health, their bills are paid, they have happy relationships, the children are acting normal, business is successful. Anybody could be positive then. Anybody can have a larger vision then. Anybody can have faith under those kinds of circumstances. See, but the real challenge, the real challenge of growth, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, comes when you get knocked down. Somebody said that, that adversity introduces a man to himself or a woman. How you handle it, that's where the growth takes place. When I was facing some challenges, I had a guy say something to me and I suggest this is one of the first things that you want to do when you're facing a challenge. You want to get unstuck. Evaluate where you are. Look at it. Assess yourself. Assess yourself and assess the situation. What brought you there? What role did you play? Earl Nightingale had a saying I like. He said, all of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. What has brought you to this point? What did you learn from it? Are you learning anything? Are you doing it over and over and over again? Somebody said that insanity is doing the same thing in the same way, expecting a different outcome. Are you going through it or are you growing through it? Are you bigger and better because of it? Because it's not going to leave you until you grow through it. I was going through a major challenge in my life that was wearing me out, that was using me. And one of my students told me in a class that I was teaching, Lessons in Truth, she said, Les, until you handle it with grace, it will stay in your face. The challenges of life. How do we get, it, how do we get stuck? A friend of mine went through a divorce. My best friend. He had a wife that did not love him as much as he loved her. It was his first real true love. He was a very religious man did not believe in divorce. He made a mistake. And he paid for his mistake with a lot of pain, a lot of tears. And there came to a point where he knew he should have gotten a divorce. But he was stuck. He was stuck in something called revenge. He said, she's made me so miserable, I'm gonna pay her back. He was stuck. And he stayed in there longer than he should have because it began to attack him. It began to affect him psychologically. And as a result of that, when he eventually did get a divorce, he took that same attitude to other relationships, looking for something to go wrong. He was burned so badly, he did not want to risk pain again. He was going in relationships trying to avoid pain. When it became too close, he would do something to make sure the relationship did not work. He would always try and find something wrong with the person because they're no perfect people. So if you look for it, you can find it. He was stuck in revenge. Another friend of mine, working on a job, loved the company very much, expected to retire there. And one day they call him in the office, ask him for his badge and identification, told the security man up, walked into his desk, told him he was fired and he had to leave then. He was devastated. And if you came anywhere near him, he will tell you his story, as we all have stories. Even when he got a job, he went on the job telling anybody who would listen how they fired him unjustly. And he always ended with, it wasn't fair. 
Life isn't fair. Life just is. It's not fair that birds eat worms, and they do. So we, we can't even deal with what's fair. But he's stuck in the fact that it's not fair. I don't deserve that. They were wrong. I used to be a state legislator in Columbus, Ohio. During the break, we used to go out on the front lawn of the Ohio legislature, at the Capitol there, and observe people as they came by. There was one particular person that all of us knew. The children, adults, everybody used to pick at him when he came by. We called him Chicken Man. He had a feather in his hat. He had a toy chicken on top of his car that he would drive around the area in downtown blinking his lights and occasionally blowing his horn. When he got out of his car, he would, drive, he would walk downtown with a baby carriage with two little baby dolls in there and a picture of a woman. And when you say something to him or came near him, you would hear him making the sounds of a chicken. All of us used to laugh at Chicken Man. We didn't know Chicken Man's story. Chicken Man woke up one morning around 3 a.m. and his house was on fire. He panicked and he got out of the window and left quickly only to get outside to hear his children and his wife screaming for help. He ran back to the door to go in to save them and the flames were too hot, too awesome. He tried to get in, he couldn't get in. He was desperate, frantic. Pretty soon the cries stopped, they perished in the fire. His brother-in-law came, found out that his sister had died and his nieces in the fire, grabbed Chicken Man and started beating him. You chicken, why did you save my sister? You're chicken, you're chicken. When the people pulled him off, Chicken Man, they picked him up and said, are you all right? And Chicken Man looked at him and he started making the sounds of a chicken. He never ever overcame that tragedy. He was stuck from that experience. None of us knew why Chicken Man went around with this picture and these little dolls. I remember when I was stuck in anger for a long time, when I made a commitment to my adopted mother that I was going to purchase her a home. I'll never forget the experience of working real hard to get the money for the down payment. Someone had told me of a beautiful home in an exclusive area of Miami. I went to see it, took my mother there, and she said, yes, I want it. It was on the water. We went to the closing. My attorney said, Les, have you had a title search? I said, what's a title search? Well, we just take a couple of days to check it out and make sure there are no liens against the property that you might have to pay if you buy this home. The guy who was there selling me the house, he said, listen, he said, the only reason that I'm selling you this house and selling it at a loss is because I admire the fact that you want to purchase this house for your mother. I have another guy who will give me substantially more money, but I like you. And I've got to get back to Philadelphia. Now, if we cannot consummate this deal now, then the deal is off. I said, there are no liens against the property? He says, no, of course not. I looked at my attorney, I said, I believe him, I'll sign. She said, Mr. Brown, I'm not questioning his honesty. She said, but business is business. I signed that contract and we had a big celebration. Everybody in the neighborhood was talking about Leslie coming home, one of the twins that Mamie adopted to buy her a home. Child, isn't that nice? God is going to bless him. A few weeks later, I received a letter, a registered letter, indicating that the house was going up for sheriff sale on the courthouse steps. A man had filed a $12,000 lien against the property because the previous owner owed him that money. And if I did not come up with $12,000 in 30 days, he was going to sell the house to the highest bidder. I called this man and said, Mister, my name is Les Brown. I purchased this house. I had nothing to do with your prior bill. He said, that's not my problem. He said, you should have had a title search. I said, can you give me time? I said, my mother is an older lady. She has a bad heart. And she, I said, please. I said, if you just give me the time, I don't know how I'm going to do it with the house note and everything else, but I think I can pay you at least $2,000 a month. And within six months, Somehow, I will pay you your money. He said, no, I want it all in 30 days or you get out. I do, did everything I could, racked my mind thinking about how I could get $12,000 because I, I took everything I could 
to get the money just for the down payment and the closing. I finally had to face the reality that I wasn't going to be able to do it. I was up around two o'clock in the morning, walking back and forth, thinking, how was I going to tell my mother this? My children were there in the room sleeping all night long. I agonized over this. I lost over 23 pounds. Pretty soon I went in the room where my mother was sleeping and I said, Mama, I got down on my knees by the bed. I said, Mama, I got to talk to you. And she said, what's wrong? I said, Mama, I said, we got to get out the house. I said, in my haste to buy the house, I made a mistake. She said, that's all right, baby. I didn't like this house anyhow. <laughs> I said, Mama, you told me you loved it. I brought our friends out here to see it. She said, you know I have arthritis in my knees, and I don't like going up the steps, but I knew it made you happy. You loved it so much. I said, Mama, I've lost 23 pounds agonizing over this. Well, we had to pack up and go back to the old house down the street from Northwestern High School in Liberty City. All those neighbors who came out and saw us leave. <laughs> those neighbors were there as we were coming back. We went in the house, the roaches were playing cards saying, come on in and take a hand. <laughs> I was wiped out. 